Thanks so much. It's great to be here and see everyone uh, here together. And it, it's fun to get to give a Bioenergy 101 because the Bioenergy 101 has always been the thing at the retreat that was at my right mental level, and I'm going to try to keep it that way. So uh, can you see anything on the slide, OK? <laughs> J just the teeniest bit. OK. Just right, OK? So, so this is meant to represent uh, what biologists trying to understand biology from a chemical perspective were facing when I was in grad school okay, in the 1990s. Okay? So you got a little sliver of the picture, and even the little sliver you got was blurry often, OK? <laughs> and, and so obviously a lot of progress was made by zooming in and trying to understand particular biomolecules, OK? And so in this case, if you zoom in on the character, you see a lot of information, OK? This is a Revolutionary War scout wearing blue, so probably American, not British, OK? And uh, you, know, you, get, you get a sense, OK? But you also are still losing a lot of information compared to seeing the whole big picture, even if you see the big picture at not that good resolution, okay? And so when you see the big picture, all the players, okay, this is the image, okay? We have the Americans trying to outflank the British in a battle, all right? And our scout is off on, on the very edge, and just seeing the scout in however high resolution doesn't tell you what in general is going on, okay? And so this is the dream for omics, is that by Measuring all the pieces, all the chemicals that make up biology, we're going to get the big picture. Now, to do that, uh, there's a, a lot of legs to the table to have solid understanding. And it all starts with the genome, all right, which of course is the blueprint. All right. The genome is so important because it's the plan that tells you what work orders you can send out. Okay? And those work orders are mRNAs that, of course, uh, constitute the transcriptome and lay the plans for which proteins you're going to make. All right? The proteome is the output in two critical respects. It's much of the physical structure of biology, and it's also the catalytic machinery all right, that makes everything happen. And a key thing that it makes happen is metabolism. That catalytic activity allows incoming nutrients, including sunlight, to be converted into usable energy and the building supplies that are needed for the whole process to run. And we now have technologies for measuring each of these legs of the table. And so uh, I'll talk about uh, these a little bit at a very high level. And I'm going to mention as we go along that we don't just have these four foundational technologies. There's also intermediate technologies that provide additional insights into how these different biological layers are connected. All right. So these technologies fundamentally fall into two categories, those that are based on the ability to sequence DNA. And much as it pains me to say it as a mass spectroscopist, all right, this has been the area probably within all of science, not just biological science, where measurement technology has advanced the most over the past two decades and is most transforming society. Right? And the immediate transformation was the ability to sequence genomes, to know the blueprint. Right? And really doing that once okay, is in tremendously impactful. But if you can do it many times, then you can look, for example, at many strains of a yeast or a plant and understand the correlation between genomic changes and phenotypic changes. Now, the blueprint, aside from rare mutations or copy number variations, is typically pretty static, okay? But access to the blueprint isn't, right? <clears throat> DNA is constantly being wound and unwound, bound and released from different factors. And so, what parts of DNA are open, what enhancers are open, what open reading frames are open is a key thing that determines which messages are sent. And this can be probed using a technique called attack seek. It basically involves tagging open chromatin so that it can be amplified and then sequenced. And this can be done now also at the single cell level to look at complexity and things like plants. What's open? 
tends to be what gets transcribed, and this leads to the transcriptome. And of course, measurements by RNA-seq of the transcriptome are probably the most common and familiar form of omic measurements to many of you. These also can now be done also at the single cell level. Ultimately, just because you make a transcript, it doesn't mean that transcript is going to be translated. And so there's a very useful technique that sits between transcriptomics and proteomics called ribosome profiling. And that's looking at which transcripts are actually bound to ribosomes, which ones are the cells paying attention to. Okay, so that can all be done with sequencing. When it comes to measuring the biomolecules that are not nucleic acids, then we need an alternative technique, and that's where mass spec kicks in. It can be used to measure proteins directly. <clears throat> this is typically done by taking the proteins, chopping them into pieces using enzymes that cut after uh, basic residues to give positively charged peptides. And then you can further chop up those peptides within the mass spectrometer to identify them based on their fragmentation patterns with signal intensity telling you their abundance. Along the way, you can often also find covalent modification events. Very similar technology using mass spectrometry can be used to look at metabolites. Often there, there's more information in how much the metabolites stick to the column and less information in how they get fragmented in the mass spectrometer because often there's so little that the fragmentation isn't that informative. A beautiful thing about these mass spec-based techniques is you can get another layer of information if you introduce isotopes, so heavy versions, for example, of nutrients, and then you can track how those nutrients flow into different metabolic pathways or into different proteins to look at protein turnover. And that's something we're going to hear more about in just a few minutes from Wendy. Now, why did I make you suffer through those seven examples of different types of omic techniques? Isn't one or two enough? And, you know, sometimes one or two will be enough, but it's very important to know that there's independent information in each of these layers. Like, you might think if we know the transcriptome, since that's the, blue, the work order is to make the proteome, then we should be able to predict the proteome. And we can, but we only get about 40% of proteome variation by measuring the transcriptome. There's a lot of regulation in terms of which transcripts bind to ribosomes, which proteins are degraded. And so that's why each of these layers uh, has a major role in understanding biology. And the dream, of course, is that if we can put all these together, we can get to biological knowledge. And that knowledge can come in a few forms, okay? It can come in seeing the big picture, as I alluded to at the beginning, but it can also come in just one specific finding. So often you make 1,000 or 10,000 measurements by omics, and it's just one interesting thing that everyone remembers. And I'll give you one example of that, and that's great when that happens. That's actually the easiest for the scientist, okay? Uh, sometimes also if we stare at this data a very, very long time, we can come to general principles. And, and I'll say whenever you do omic science, the thinking about the data part uh, becomes just a giant component of how you spend your time. So here's one example uh, drawn from earlier work from my lab. It's a biomedical example of how one particular signal proved valuable. Right? This was an example where we started by comparing cells that did or did not have a mutation in a particular enzyme of the TCA cycle, this basic metabolic pathway. And we knew that this particular mutation was genomically linked to cancer. And what we saw is we were able to measure about 600 metabolites, which is our standard. None of the ones we normally measured changed. Then there are about 10,000 other signals, okay? And just one of those signals changed dramatically, okay, as you can see on the screen. And that happened to be a signal for a weird metabolite. It's actually just the two electron reduction product of the normal product of the enzyme. So the enzyme was eating up its product to make a weird metabolite. It turns out that that weird metabolite actually causes cancer. And by blocking its production using drugs, which of course took years for a pharmaceutical company to develop, now their patient's being cured of leukemia by preventing this metabolite production. Okay. Here's an example of general principles. So here we went about measuring uh, the metabolome, but we did it with one extra bit of effort. We used isotopic internal standards to measure the absolute concentrations 
of metabolites. Okay? Why do we care about that? Well, that allows us to compare the concentrations of metabolites in cells to the KM values, the Michaelis constants, of the enzymes that use them. Right? And now all of a sudden we can say, is the amount of metabolite in the cell enough to saturate an enzyme active site? And if you look at the data here, the key thing is that most of the data points are up and to the left. Okay? Most of them are above, okay, in terms of concentration, the KM value of the enzyme that uses them. So each data point is a metabolite concentration relative to the KM of the consuming enzyme. This means that most enzyme active sites in cells are saturated. And we've done this in bacteria, we've done this in yeast, we've done this in all different mammalian tissues. We haven't done it in plants yet, I apologize. But the message, at least in those other three branches of biology, is always the same. Most enzyme active sites are saturated. And the few cases where they're not saturated are really quite logical and informative. For example, the light blue points here are degradative enzymes that consume an apparent high value product. They're sitting there in E. coli just in case the E. coli comes across a trove of an amino acid and its amino acid level goes very high, okay? But otherwise, they're sitting there with their active sites empty, right? So I, I want to end uh, with one uh, thought. Since I'm a metabolomics person, I can't do anything to help you guys with most of the techniques we talked about today. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I can potentially help uh, with metabolomics. And I want to point out, it is a broadly useful technique. And a cool thing about the technique is that, at least for core metabolism, it's the same if we're dealing with an ecological field sample or a yeast that's been engineered by Huey Min's group. All right? And so we have measurement methods for this. We're very open to collaboration. Uh, there's also other expertise in metabolomics uh, within CABI that you can access. And so we'll hear some about general resources, but there also are CABI-specific resources so don't, don't hesitate to reach out to me if any of the uh, potential types of information on this slide interest you. And with that, I'll wrap up and take questions. Hi. Um, so I guess the last slide kind of ruined my question because you said you're a metabolomics person. But I was interested in the bridges between the... Uh, the methods that you showed earlier on. So for example, I've uh, many times encountered where RNA doesn't seem to match what the protein function. Uh, a good example of this is I know there was two uh, enzymes that produce fatty acids. If you look at their RNA-seq data, one is in a, they're in a two to one ratio, yet the end product is actually nine to one. Mm -hmm. So even though we're taking these RNA-seq values as law, then it really isn't that, that case. There's got to be this more. So I guess my question comes to, what are the differences when you start to take RNA-seq, and then you go riboseq, and then you go protein? How much of that reflective, how reflective really is the RNA-seq data? And have we for too long taken RNA-seq as being just this is what's happening, this is the protein level where it isn't correct. Yeah, it, it's a great question, and uh, that's something where uh, members of the Convergen team have explicitly looked at, at this question, uh, particularly Martin Wuerr, who was on the first round of CAVI. And you know, if you look at the slide I showed, actually the number one determinant of protein abundance uh, in at least some meta-analyses is not transcript abundance, but it's the propensity of that transcript to bind to ribosomes and be translated. And so uh, I would say in, in Martin's work, at least half of the gap between the transcriptome and the proteome is bridged by doing ribosome profiling. So the binding of transcripts to ribosomes is extremely important in determining protein abundances, particularly in determining absolute protein abundances, as you alluded to. So it's actually not surprising at all that you may have a two to one ratio of transcripts, but then one of them is translated three times better, something like this, and this gives you a six or nine to one ratio in terms of protein expression. So one thing I, w I have often considered is maybe that the cell is actually storing these RNAs for a quick response to sort of abiotic or biotic stressors. Do you have any idea about whether that actually occurs? Is there a reason to create more RNA than what you would want to put? Because that seems a very expensive thing for the cell 
on a metabolic level, yeah, produce all this RNA and then just have it st standing around in the cell? Uh, it's another great question, so I'll make a, a few comments on it. One is that mRNA is relatively cheap to the cell, so a vast majority of RNA is ribosomal RNA. What's expensive to the cell is primarily ribosomes, and the next most expensive thing in the RNA category is a tRNA. Okay, so the mRNA is relatively rare and therefore relatively inexpensive. I don't know of any evidence of it being stored and hoarded uh, for a rainy day. I, I really do think these are normally like actionable work orders, okay? But um, what I will say is that often you can make the biggest discoveries, I think, by working at these closely related layers of omics because that's where if there is some big new design principle like RNA storage, it's gonna be evident, okay? It's gonna be most easy to figure that out if you compare uh, the transcriptome to ribosome profiling, not if you compare the transcriptome to downstream metabolic flux or something that's quite distal. So having them, having them as paired technologies in the future. Yeah, I, I think the close, the close paired technologies are very powerful for figuring out the intervening regulation or the intervening design principles in biology. Thank you. I guess what, one of your seven wasn't enzymomic enzymomics, but obviously in your previous slide, you've determined the KM of a huge number of samples. How, how was that done? Because it could be really valuable to CABI. <laughs> yeah, so we, we unfortunately don't have like a magic way of determining tons of enzyme KMs. That's all from the Brenda database. So that's just taking advantage of all the integrated knowledge of the history of biochemistry and overlaying it on our absolute concentration measurements. Uh, those we can make writ large by having the right sets of isotopic standards sitting around. Um, and, and we're happy to make them for you know, particular plants or plant cell types if it's useful. But yeah, someone still has to express the enzymes and make those titration curves. Uh, but, but a lot of that has been done and is in Brenda. Great, thank you all.